What's up guys? Welcome back to Fisher Hex. My name is Travis. Today we're going to be doing another email Q&A number whatever I put in the uh, title of the video and we are looking at questions back from March. So yeah, it's June a little bit behind. So hopefully going to get several of these videos out in the next week or two to catch up on the questions. Now, the way these work, I'm going to answer as many questions as I possibly can within the next 10 minutes, and then we're just going to save the rest for another video to kind of help you guys from not getting bored from them going over the 10 minute mark. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, first question. I'm having an issue running a display refugium. I am using an eShops overflow box, but the siphon pipe continues to have air in the pocket. What would be your solution to get rid of the air in the pocket? I have tried an airline and the sucking it out approach, but it hasn't worked. It hasn't been working out. It's really gross sucking fishy salt water in my pie hole. <laughs> Any help would be appreciated. All right. Uh, easy solution. Get the aqua lifter pump. A lot of people who use hang on the back overflows uh, tend to use this because the tube will go up into that little, I guess, um, bend where the water is coming through and it's always running to suck the air slash water out so it never ends up uh, getting that bubble now one thing that will happen if you don't have this or you have a really uh, crappy designed overflow box or hang on the back overflow box uh, when the power goes out if that bubble gets too big it's not going to start siphoning again and then you're just going to be dumping water over the rim of your tank because it has nowhere to go when the power kicks back on so Anybody who uses a hang on a back overflow box, I recommend using the aqua lifter pump or something like that. And uh, yeah, they're relatively cheap. I think they're like under 20 bucks. So hopefully that helps you out. All right, moving on. In your next Q&A, can you discuss verminted snails and how to get rid of them? Thanks. Um, the first thing you want to do is prevention. I've talked about this in my verminted snail video I posted, I don't know, a couple months ago because I do have them in the 300 gallon. Your first thing you're going to want to do is prevent them from going in. Uh, uh, quarantine all your coral, checking during the process and having them in quarantine for an extended period of time, especially your LPS, your hammers, your torches, lobos, stuff like that. As I mentioned, I got them in my 300 even after doing a 30 day quarantine because they didn't show up until later on the base of that giant lobo that used to be in the 300, which by the way, I'm getting back because my client is outgrowing his tank. So it's going to be coming back to the 300. You guys will see that probably by the end of the month and uh, or yeah, end of the month. We're already at the end of the month soon all right now you you want to prevent them that's the best thing you can do now if they're already in your tank what you want to do is um you can manually remove them i talked about this as well you can go in there with bone cutters uh, tweezers pliers whatever is kind of safe for your tank I, obviously if you have rusty pliers don't throw them in your tank but you can go in there and you can break them off uh, you can put super glue over the ends of them if you only have a couple of them which is relatively easy but if you get a ton of them like i have with high flow and a lot of detritus and a lot of um, you know stuff going around in the water column they grow really quickly and um, another thing a lot of people have done that's been successful is add butterfly fish I've heard of that working and bumblebee snails which is a predatory snail which will eat them now I have bumblebee snails in the 300 have they made a difference I don't know probably but nothing that I can really see um, because I have so many they're not really a huge deal I go in there and I scrape them off if they start messing with the coral but right now the SPS and the amount of flow in they have in that tank they're not really a problem but again what you want to do is you want to prevent them from the start now another thing that a lot of people don't realize is when they buy live rock they come in on live rock so if you're going to the store and you're buying it that's why i always recommend people buying dry rock and then curing it because you that's just one of a thousand different pests that you can eliminate altogether by just skipping the step of buying it um, live so hopefully that answers your question and good luck with them okay next question I have been reading and watching a bunch of information on starting a new saltwater tank. Of course, I want to do this correctly the first time to help eliminate any issues from ignorance. A few questions on a few topics. One, uh, when doing a fishless cycle, how high should I try to get the ammonia levels? I've been adding frozen food for 10 days and the ammonia has gotten up to two, but is that high enough? Question mark. Well, I'll tell you right now, I have never tested ammonia in a saltwater tank. And if I did, it was really early on and it just was part of my stuff coming over from my uh, freshwater days. When it comes to cycling a saltwater tank, I focus on nitrites and nitrates. What's gonna happen is when you're adding the food, of course, the um, it's gonna break down and then the ammonia is gonna spike. The first bacteria is gonna come in is one that um, breaks that down to nitrites, and then a secondary bacteria will come along and break the nitrites down to nitrates. When you stop seeing nitrites, and you're only seeing nitrates, that means the tank is cycled and you can go about adding fish and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully answers that part of the question. Uh, the next part here is, uh, I'm not sure what the bio load is normally for two fish. Second question, 
when I'm uh, ready to add fish slash soft corals to the tank, is there a general rule of thumb as to which to add first? From what I've read so far, it seems coral help filter, but do they also add a bio load? Just trying to get an idea and prep for the next step. Okay, so when it comes to adding fish or coral first, I always like to have fish first. Fish, when they poop and pee in the water, that adds to the nutrients levels, which then, yes, corals do uptake a certain amount of nutrients. Now, don't expect a full tank to keep your nitrates in check and your phosphates in check, but they do require a certain amount of them to help them grow. Uh, soft corals as well, LPS and SPS. And uh, that's why they say you should keep a recommended level of uh, 3 to 5 ppm of nitrates and 0.05 to 0.015 of phosphates, kind of in between there. And that's where I personally keep the 300 gallons. So that's why they recommend you keep a certain level of those nutrients. And I feel that adding fish first really helps those nutrients stay consistent and then adding coral later. But I've had people do it vice versa, no issues. And um, one thing I could tell is based on the questions that you're asking, I would say uh, don't try to overthink this too much. It seems like you're diving into things that probably aren't aren't not as necessary as you think they are but then again you are just starting out and these are going to be uh things that might be running through a beginner's mind it's been a while since i've been into that been in that mindset so i would say uh, you're doing a great job um trying to figure out these very uh, minute basic things but uh, i would say uh, just keep it simple and you'll be successful all right so hopefully that answers your questions Okay, so next question. Hey, Fish of Hex, I've been reading up on UVA and its role in lighting spectrum for many SPS. I am getting conflicted information. In your opinion, is UV important? I have the old radions with no UV. The second part of the question is, what two ATI bulbs would you supplement LEDs with if you could only use two? And the third question is, how do you download the Ecotech A plus uh, lighting schedule or is it only for Gen 4, not Gen 3? Okay, so the first part is, is UV important? Yes, uh, I feel that it is. There's been a lot of studies out there on how UV interacts with the Zuzanthelli. And as we progress through the hobby, we are doing these studies and hence the reason why Ecotech has added the UV to their new lights, um, you know, Gen 4s, which I currently have over the 300. And and uh, that's just part of the thing. They, they're progressing in their knowledge and they're realizing that the UV is important. Um, I will try to find a link to a study for it and put it in the comment section. Uh, no um, guarantees on that because I'll probably forget during the editing process. But uh, there are uh, there has been studies out there showing that the UV is important for the overall growth and the Zuzanthelli. So uh, the second part of that is um, if I had to cho choose between two ATI bulbs, what would they be? Well, on the 300, I have, of course, the Radeon supplemented by T5s. Now, I use Actinic and Blue Plus. And if you can only have two, so it's just going to be two on one side of the lights, or is it two sets giving you uh, four bulbs? So, so I'm kind of confused on that. But I would say uh, the two bulbs that I use that I've been successful with are the Blue Plus and the Actinic. So I would supplement with that. Um, now, when it comes to the UV, obviously those Gen 3s have worked uh, really well in the past people were successful in growing coral so is it light is it end all be all you need to have uv no but is it going to help of course anything with these newer um, generations of lights and how they're implementing new spectrums and fine-tuning them of course they're going to be better than a previous generation hence the generation increasing so uh, that's my two cents i wouldn't go out and spend a thousand dollars on new lighting if you're happy with the gen 3s and you're getting coral growth that's fine there's people who didn't even have leds that grew a ton of coral that did really well so i wouldn't over stress about the uv uh, the third part when it comes to the um, Ecotech AB, AB Plus Spectrum. If you're doing it through the WXM, you can definitely download it. Um, now, when it comes to the app, I'm not sure for um, the Ecotech, uh, what is it, whatever, Ecotech Live or Smart, whatever it is. I don't use that. I use the WXM through the Apex. Um, I would say if you are if you can't download it, just try to imitate it as much as you can. I have a video up on a 300 of my lighting schedule. You can go in there and you can adjust, what is there, uh, six bars in the Gen 3? I'm almost positive these six or channels or eight. I know there's eight on the new one. I'm, there might be only um, six on the Gen 3. I never had the Gen 3, so I couldn't uh, kind of confirm that for you. But I would say uh, try to imitate as much as you can. You're going to want to get your your blues, your your uh, violets, and your purples, and your, you know, um, all your blues are going to be kind of high as you can get them. And then you're going to want your greens and your reds uh, lower, like uh, 10 to 15 percent. And then you want your whites to be around uh, 25 to 35 percent. Again, depending, you, you kind of want to do it the way it looks good for you, but try to stay within that spectrum and just do your best to uh, to create it. OK, so it looks like we're already at the 10 minute mark and I've only answered like four questions. So I'm going to answer one more. We're going to call it for this video and we'll do another one in the next couple days. So 
Final question here. I have a 20 gallon tank and I'm having trouble with keeping my level stable in my tank between weekly and bi-weekly water changes. I only have LPS in there for now, but would love to see it thrive with SPS. What is the best way to keep consistent salinity, calcium, alkalinity, et cetera, out of, out of such a small system? Well, when it comes to small systems, uh, depending on what you have in it will depend on what you need to keep it stable. And what I mean by that is if you have just LPS and your alkalinity is dropping in between those bi-weekly water changes, the simple thing you can do right there is go from bi-weekly to every single week, say on a Sunday, do your 20% water change. That will help keep the alkalinity and calcium levels stable until the point where they will not. And then at that time, you will need to implement something like two-part calc wasser or a calcium reactor to be able to uh, keep those levels stable. But with such a small system, I would stick with maybe the two-part since that's going to be the easiest to implement on such a small tank. Now, when it comes to salinity, the best thing you want to do is have a, a TO system. That always keeps the salinity stable, and I recommend that regardless of any size tank that you have. Now, that's about it. When I see we talked about calcium, DKH, or alkalinity, and salinity. Other than that, keep up with your water changes. Once your water changes are no, no longer able to keep your alkalinity stable, then consider adding something else, again, like calc washer or two-part. But that's about it, guys. Um, hope you enjoy the video. If you do like this type of video, please let me know in the comment section. Um, is, two, is 10 minutes too short? Because I felt like it was too short, but a lot of people are falling off in the analytics around the 10-minute mark, so I try to keep them around then, and my refrigerator just kicked on. Anyways, uh, that's about it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to be part of this, please send me questions to fishofhex at gmail.com. Please f avoid the paragraphs and, like, all the, un not, the, all the nonsense talk. Just go ahead and put your questions in. One, two, three, wing, bang, spang, dong. And um, I will answer them in order there. It just makes it easier to get this video done. So until next time, I'll see you guys later. Peace.